Good afternoon. Good afternoon, Marie, everyone. <laughs> How is everybody doing today on a uh, rainy afternoon in the Edmonton area? I suppose I should say good morning or good uh, evening uh, for some of our friends who might be uh, elsewhere internationally. Uh, but welcome, welcome to the Conversations with Dune and Friends. And today we have a, a, a fantastic friend, a fabulous friend joining us is uh, Rosemary Seaver. Rosemary Seaver is going to join us uh, in just a moment here. And uh, before bringing her on um, stage here, I'd like to just uh, give her a quick introduction here. So, so Rosemary is an Edmonton-born saxophonist who, who started a classical as a classical player and had uh, a professional career for the, the bulk of her career has been uh, on the classical side. And uh, she uh, is one of the approximately 150 foreigners who uh, have had the privilege of studying with the renowned classical saxophonist, Jean-Marie Lundes. And uh, in Bordeaux, France. Now, Lundes is pronounced uh, L-O-N-D-E-I-X. And uh, so, you know, with, uh, with that kind of a background, uh, later on, though, um, then the shoulder issues became uh, problematic along the way and uh, almost ended her career at one, po at one point. And uh, she had to think about uh, what she really wanted to do. And uh, uh, at some point, looking at uh, uh, MBA applications, you know, Master's of Business uh, Administration, and, uh, and also uh, things like uh, voice lessons and, and uh, uh, also three years of physiotherapy and uh, and then she got into pop music and, and sort of giving that uh, a bit more time and uh, she found a home in rock and blues though uh, rock and blues and beyond and she has performed with uh, the Pointer Sisters, Frankie Valley, Bobby Cameron and Daryl Barr to name a few. She's a regular uh, member of the X band, uh, a Latin sensation Uptown, St. Bliss, as well as the Rosemary C. Jazz Trio. Uh, also the uh, Studio B Quartet, as well as the uh, uh, various other local bands. So it's so a very kind of eclectic and diverse, uh, uh, different types of bands that she um, uh, works with. And uh, so with, with that brief introduction, I'd like to uh, uh, have you join me in welcoming Rosemary Seaver. Welcome, Rosemary. How are you today? <laughs> Hi, Dune. Uh, I'm doing really well. How about you? Good, 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 good. Well, thank you for joining us on this uh, rainy day. I know it's, uh, uh, I don't know how you feel about rain, but every time I see rain, uh, I actually uh, get a really nice relaxing mode and uh, memories of uh, living in a country where rain was actually quite uh, common. And uh, so we have a lot of good memories from rain. Um, your thoughts on rain? Uh, how do you? I have not been outside yet today. I actually do like it a lot when it, when it rains. Um, mm -hmm. When it's pouring so much that you can't do anything, um, not not so much of a fan of that. But um, I'll I'll probably go out later today with my dog and take her out for a walk. So we'll be out somewhere in the River Valley mm -hmm. at some point, and she'll be uh, a big soggy, wet, smelly mess probably when we get back because that's. That's what happens with my dog in the rain. Right, right, right. <laughs> so uh, wonderful. I am just checking out with our viewers here. We have a few viewers joining us here, um, uh, coming online here, because uh, uh, I just want to make sure that we are heard and, and uh, the sound is balanced. But uh, so uh, I assume you can hear me uh, loud and clear over there, uh, Rosemary? Yes, I can hear you perfectly. This is great. Oh. Thank you. Wonderful. So, so tell us beyond the introduction that I have started there, maybe tell us a story or a, a bit of a, a journey of, um, you know, where you started in uh, music or any other aspects that you want to share and then sort of uh, move us along and, and, uh, and bring us to today quickly, if you could. Um, that's, uh, <laughs> there's a lot, there's a lot. Long, um, long time I, ago, Rosemary I will was born start in, with, yeah. yes, that's right. Um, I will say that um, I am the youngest of six kids and all of us had to take music. Uh, my parents were not uh, musicians. They were not even particularly, I know that they did choir and stuff, but they weren't even very good at it. But that was a big thing for them was promoting music in um, my, in our lives. And all of my siblings took piano lessons. I remember as a kid, 
you know, listening to them practice. I did do your piano, but then I ended up quitting. I, I really didn't like it. Mm -hmm. And uh, we all did band. So like my oldest brother played tuba. The next one was a saxophone player. Then we had trombone, trumpet. My sister played saxophone. Mm -hmm. And then I got to grade seven band and my mother begged me to play the flute. She really wanted me to play the flute. And she specifically said, <laughs> do not come home with a saxophone because she had driven my sister's baritone saxophone around the city probably for about two or three years by this point and i think she was quite tired of it yeah. so um in my band program uh we we had to try each week of clarinet uh trombone trumpet and uh flute and um and then when you did well on those ones you would be allowed to try other instruments and i tried to get a sound on the flute i could do all the fingerings could barely get a sound out of it. Mm -hmm. And, uh, and I thought, you know, I think I'd like to play the French horn. Mm -hmm. And uh, one day after school, a friend of mine said, Hey, we're going to go try out some saxophones after school. And I said, Nah, I think I'm going to play the French horn. Mm -hmm. And she said, Nah, it's just, it's just a try. It doesn't hurt, you know, to try. And I went, Oh, okay. So I went mm -hmm. and uh, I was, I was sold from the moment on. It was like, it, it, it was just, I don't know why, but I felt like it was the right place. And I played piano. I had done violin for a number of years. And uh, so then I showed up with a saxophone and it took my mother a, a number of years to forgive me for that. <laughs> uh, and I think that by the time I finished high school, she was quite surprised when I decided to go into music. Because after af having all uh, my siblings, who'd all done really well, actually, as musicians, and none of them went into music, I think that she just didn't, it just didn't, it didn't occur to her that, that this would happen. And then when I announced that I was moving to France, actually two years after that, uh, she was really up in arms about that. Um, mm -hmm. I, of course, she wanted me to go, but she also, I mean, she didn't want me to go. Right. Mm -hmm. yeah, and absolutely. so uh, that was, that was a tough two years for her and for me too. You know, I, I really missed her a lot. And, uh, but yeah, this, that's where I've, been ever since and um it's kind of funny because i love um i love the saxophone i actually really quite like the flute um i, I do have a flute i'm not very good at it um but mm -hmm. i mean i do have one and so yeah that's kind of how that happened for me and uh right now, now sorry, you, you, you said saxophone uh, uh please expand i mean you play all types of saxophone i'm guessing you have a favorite one in terms of the uh, but, but tell us about that you, you play various saxes and and your yeah. favorite is <clears throat> well the bulk of classical repertoire is written for alto i mean there's a lot of other stuff that's out there for other instruments but the the main sort of typical french classical repertoire was was on alto and I played alto and loved playing alto for many years. Mm -hmm. Had uh, I loved playing baritone, I loved soprano, kind of didn't really like tenor. I just always felt like the sound was from the room next door. Mm -hmm. And now that's pretty much all I play is tenor. And I really <laughs> love tenor now, yeah. um, oddly enough. And I just started playing my alto again for the first time, like regularly in the last few months because I've got another project that I wanted to do that involves playing my alto. So. For now, I kind of have to say it's my tenor, mm -hmm. but in four months that might change. You know, so, when I yeah. when I met you, uh, it was the baritone that you uh, you were sort of uh, playing quite often yeah, back then, right? That, that's right, and I mm -hmm. love that horn. Um, I don't I don't like having to transport it much. Yeah, yeah, that's that's a big it's a big beast to drag around. It's an awkward weight. It probably weighs about thirty five or forty pounds in the case and Mm -hmm. The reeds are expensive <laughs> and, uh, you know, it's just a big beast. But I do love Barry. I haven't played it for a while, though. Yeah, wow. yeah. Now, now you, uh, in terms of the uh, various, um, you, you do a lot of teaching as well, right? You've done a lot of teaching and continue to I've, do so. Tell us a bit about that. I do a lot of teaching. Um, I love teaching. Uh, I have many friends who are band teachers. I've had some band teacher friends of mine talk about how they can't wait to get out of teaching junior high and move on to high school with older kids. Mm -hmm. But I kind of like the junior high students there. Mm -hmm. It's, it's, a, it's such an interesting age. Um, they're sort of, they're 
geeky and awkward sometimes and sort of nerdy, but they're still mm -hmm. extremely receptive. And mm -hmm. um, I, I really, I end up doing a lot of band clinics for junior high kids in particular, but I, I've taught high school students. I, I've done a lot of university prep auditions for high school students before. Yeah. Um, I have actually my studio right now, I have more adults than I have kids mm -hmm. and I love teaching adults. It's a mm -hmm. totally, totally different thing, but yeah, I've done many, many, many years of teaching. Um, I used to do teaching, um, not of saxophone, but I was a teaching artist for the National Arts Center mm -hmm. uh, years ago for a program called the uh, Musical Live Program. Mm -hmm. And um, that was working with grades four to six students. And it was talking about um, importance of music in our lives, uh, orchestral music. Um, we would do some explorations with other things. I did some team teaching with a Cree artist by the name of Cheryl Suapagaham, who's fantastic. And um, and we would incorporate uh, visual arts as part of that as well. So, I mean, it was mm -hmm. kind of this all-encompassing thing. Some years the theme would change. So we would mm -hmm. be talking about minuets and I teach minuet dance steps or, yeah. yeah, it would just be whatever we kind of made that program to be for that year. Mm -hmm. Lots of fun. Yeah, yeah. Now, I know we have some video clips to share with our uh, guests here, our viewers here later on, and we also have uh, some of your original compositions as well. Uh, but what I'd like to do is maybe uh, share some of the uh, photos that uh, you have out there and, and maybe tell us uh, your thoughts as relates to uh, maybe the, the photo shoot that you had or, or what um, what stage of your career you were at when you were uh, uh, when these photos are shot. So, so I'm going to just bring that on screen here. So uh, let me see. If, I'm going to actually go off camera. So then uh, there'll be more sort of screen okay. space there. Sure. All right. So we are going to do it like that. And we're going that's, to. Yeah, that's from last fall. Actually, I totally forgot to mention in my bio that I've also been playing with the Lynn Twill Blues Band. <laughs> and I course. feel really badly that I totally <laughs> forgot about that. Yeah, um, yeah. Yeah, and that actually, that that photo shoot was part of uh, the band poster for the Lynchwell Band. Um, we went to Memphis earlier this year, um, fortunately before everything closed down, well, before we even knew that things would be closing down um, for the International Blues Challenge. And uh, that was that was a great, that was a great time. It was a great week. Lots of amazing bands, um, lots of amazing musicians. It was... Uh, Lots of great food. I think I didn't see a fruit for ten days, um, so it was uh, it was fun. And that was taken by uh, Rocco Macri, who did did that shot for us. Yeah, it's yeah. a love. It's a great shot. I love that. I used it on my business cards. Actually, I asked him for permission to do that because I liked it so much. It was really good. Yeah, yeah, wonderful. So uh, I will add that uh, to now. I'm trying, trying to remember the spelling of uh, uh, sh her last name, uh, Lynchwell. As uh, oh, Twill, C H W Y L L. Perfect. You know what? Uh, I have now uh, Lynchwell. I have now updated it. So now the crawling text across has that now included. And okay. I'll also update the uh, the the, the, uh, the bio there, but uh, so so yeah. You, obviously, uh, this is a, a tenor. It looks like too. Yeah, that's my tenor. Yeah, you know, even a tenor looks pretty big, and of course, the baritone would be even bigger, right? <laughs> yeah. Yes. <laughs> yeah, I can't even imagine. Like, I, there are, there are bigger saxophones out there, right? Uh -huh. There's uh, bass, contrabass. And uh, I mean, apart from them being really expensive to procure and have, I just mm -hmm. hauling one of those things around is. Uh, yeah. Yeah. Oh yeah, this so is. Yeah, you from, are having uh, some fun, yeah. Yeah, 2015. Yeah, with my tenor as well. That was, uh, or not 2015. That was 2012. Mm -hmm. um, Debbie Boca Boca Bella of Boca Bella mm -hmm. Photography did that whole. She did a bunch of photo shots for me that day. Yeah. Um, yeah. She's a great, great photographer. She's a she's a great fan. Uh, a makeup artist too. Mm -hmm. And, um, and she's really, really good with Photoshop because actually I had that shot that you did with me on the gym floor. She mm -hmm. took out all the gym lines, even in my, my hair and everything. It was really impressive how she, she did that. Um, yeah. yeah, that was a lot of fun. That was in the third floor of the third and second floors of the Yellowhead Brewery before they yeah. redid a bunch of that stuff that was up there.
Wow. You know, when you when you said about the the work that goes into it uh, in, in any profession to get from good to great, uh, there's a lot of details that need to be taken care of, right? A lot of details, a lot of sweat equity. I think um, I I hear people sort of throw the word talent around a lot, like mm -hmm. oh, they're so talented, and I'm. Uh, it's not that it's a real criticism of of people using that word. Personally, I don't like that word for a number of reasons, and it's it doesn't really. I, some people, yes, sure, they have a, a better innate sense for certain things than other musicians would, for example, just because they grew up listening to a certain genre of music, and so they're feeling much more attuned to it or whatever. Mm -hmm. But um, I think that when it comes right down to it, for anybody even if they are in their sort of genre that they grew up with or whatever, there's a lot of sweat equity that's gone into that. I mean, very few people, like when you see programs like The Voice or American Idol, mm -hmm. most of those people didn't fall out of bed singing. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, they've been singing for a long time. I mean, there might be the occasional person where they have, but Mm -hmm. You know, a lot of people have put in a lot of hours and a lot of time. And, um, and, and so the word talent to me doesn't always reflect that. Mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. And I, I know from my own experience and lots of other people that I've worked with, um, we've put in a lot of hours, a lot mm -hmm. of hours, a lot of dedication. Yeah. So, yeah. yeah. You do all the hard work to make it look easy. That's true. And there are lots of times where um, I hear things and I go, wow, they make that sound so easy. Even when I was reorganizing my studio, I had found some old mini discs of classical performance that I had forgotten that I even had. And I was listening to them going, wow, like that sounds so easy. But I know I never thought that was easy when I was playing this stuff. But yeah. but it just it, your perception changes very, you know, it's been 20 years since some of those performances that I listened to. So it was, uh, it was really, it's really nice actually sort of going back into that and going, you know, because you can, we're always our worst critics too, right? Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And, uh, and I remember at the time hearing this, I'm going, oh, that's so bad. Like, I, this could be better and this could be better. But now I, I listen to some of those things and I go, you know, I had some really great moments in in those and I, i'm really quite proud of a lot of that work that i've done in the past it just seems so long ago and now i feel like i'm on this weird sort of junior high journey of relearning uh genres that i never really used to work in as a classical player right so it's this has been a lot of learning for me for the last five or six years yeah a bit it's of a like this steep steep learning curve always like now because i've got all this time i'm working on things that i'd wished i'd had time to work on and mm -hmm. uh i'm not thinking that i'm going to be a bebop player mm -hmm. but i am working on bebop stuff right now and it's uh it's tough like it's it's tough so yeah. um as I, i've told my students in the past they say you know it sounds really daunting when i say that the learning never ends because mm -hmm. the learning never ends mm -hmm. but the good side of it is I'm rarely bored. I can't think of a time where I've been really, truly bored. And if I have been, it's been extremely fleeting. Mm -hmm. So um, these are these are things that I will always, always do. Um, the other thing that I that I do all the time is I uh, I like to practice languages. That was one of my things that came out of Europe. And so I'm in my Duolingo app practicing languages because I don't want to lose that stuff. I mean, I that took a lot of work and time when I was there. And uh, I learned Italian when I was living in Europe as well. And so I, I'm, I'm always trying to stay on top of that stuff and kind of keep in contact with it so I don't lose that. I know there's Google Translate, but it's not the same thing, right? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I'm sure you find that too, right? Because you're a multilinguist as well, aren't yes. you? Yes, yes. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and so it's not, I mean, sure. I mean, you could sit there and do all the Google Translate stuff, I suppose, but it's not the same thing as sort of like, like in your, in French and, and Italian, like they say, the, the, the courant, la, la langue courante, like the running language, right? The flowing language. Mm -hmm. And that's lost in translation programs, even if they're very good translation programs. It's not the same thing as sort of hearing it and understanding the nuance. Mm -hmm. A lot like music. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> Yeah, I just want to confirm. Lynn's first name is it with an e? Oh, with an it's a, e. With a, oh, yeah. Lynn L uh, L Y. Ooh, L Y N. 
N E. Yeah. And yeah. and it's twill with it with a C starts with a C. I saw it. You had an S there. It's C H W Y, and it might be only one L. I, I, yeah, that's really I, bad. You are right. Yeah, you are right. So <laughs> our apologies. There we go. Oh. So, and for anybody who wants to look up Jean Marie Londex, his last name is pronounced Londex. Um, mm -hmm. He is still alive. Um, I, I saw him last year, actually. My, my family and I, we went to France and we went to Bordeaux because I had not been there since I left. And we had lunch with him. And I had lunch there with three of my classmates whom I also had not seen since I had left. Two of them were not even French students. One of them was uh, from Algeria and the other guy was from Russia and they both emigrated and they live in Bordeaux. So it was it was just such a fantastic, fantastic visit. And my professor, uh, Jean-Marie, made lunch for all of us. There were like eight of us. And he's, I think he's gonna be 89 this year. Mm -hmm. He made this fantastic meal. It was, it was lovely. Yeah, it was yeah. so, so beautiful. Yeah. So, so tell us the uh, the experience of going from uh, you know primarily classical player, classical oh, uh, yeah. uh, to, to now probably much less classical and, and a lot of uh, as you say blues and and uh, various yeah. other genres. What was that like? I don't do any classical stuff anymore except demonstrations for kids. That's mm -hmm. the only time I play it now. Um, well. When I was having all my shoulder issues, that was a that was a really big that was three or four years. I actually decided to retire from playing. Mm -hmm. I was gonna mm -hmm. go do an MBA. I mm -hmm. had given up my studio, gave up all my students. I took voice lessons with Larry Benson, who was fabulous, and it was kind of almost like therapy for me when I was going to the voice lessons because I still wanted to have that connection. And I had always been a singer actually for many, many years anyway. Mm -hmm. And uh, and then I started having some success with the physio and I was able to play again a little bit more, which made me extremely happy because I didn't realize how much I missed it, but I really didn't play much for about three years. Mm -hmm. And, um, and then one day I get a call from uh, a work colleague of mine. Well, not work colleague. And we hadn't really worked much together. It was Don Berner, jazz player in town. And he said, I need a sub tonight to come and play in this band, mm -hmm. play tenor because uh, the tenor player can't be there can you come? And I said, sure. So I went to this rehearsal and it was all like seventies disco cover tunes. Uh, yeah. And, uh, and one of the singers, uh, Chris Mena, uh, who's a fantastic singer. Who's one of the, the owners of Sabor Divino, um, said, Oh, aren't you playing here regularly? I thought it'd be great to have a, a chick in the section. Mm -hmm. And I said, no, I'm just subbing. But then I, I emailed, uh, Mark Bodan, the, the leader of the band. And I said, I have to be in this band. <laughs> and so then the Barry player quit and I ended up playing baritone saxophone and mm -hmm. doing backup vocals for them for about 10 years. And that was just a ride. And that was sort of this slow changeover. It wasn't until about four or five years into that, that I, I realized I'm really not very good at improvising. I'm actually terrible at it. And I kind of would like to change that. So I ended up going to the jam at JR's bar and grill with where Eric Martin was hosting it. Mm -hmm. um, cause I knew Eric and I knew that he would be a good critic. Like he would be a constructive critic. Mm -hmm. And I went there and just had my butt kicked around the room every week for mm -hmm. many, many weeks. And I, I had many moments of, oh, this is awful. And then some weeks would be like, oh, this is, this is okay. I think I can take some of this. And then the next week it would be, oh, I don't know what happened last week. That was good. But today was terrible. Like it was just mm -hmm. this sort of up and down and up and down and trial and error. And yeah, it was uh, great fun. Yeah. yeah. You bet. Uh, reinvention is uh, not easy and, and some people never get around to it. And some people uh, are not brave enough to actually do the work and, and uh, you know, be. It's be, really yeah. hard as an adult mm -hmm. actually. Cause when you're 12, you don't, you care sort of, but not in the same way. Everybody's in the same boat. Yeah. When you're 12 or 13 years old, right? You're all starting from the same point. But as an adult, to go from one area where I was, you know, uh, at the top of my game, sort of as a classical player, and mm -hmm. then to find myself back as a 13 year old as an improviser mm -hmm. um, was really, that was really hard. That was mm -hmm. really hard. And I, and I still go through those moments. Like mm -hmm. I, I, and I have friends of mine who say, 
really, it doesn't sound that bad where I just go, oh, I, you know, this is driving me crazy. Like, you know, so it's, um, I, I'm always going through that process of reassessing how I sound. And actually I've realized recently, I don't think I listened to enough recordings of myself. So I've been mm. starting to do more of that. And I'm finding that to be pretty, it's not even humbling. It's just, you hear things and go, oh, I kind of knew I was doing that. But now that I hear it, I know why I need to stop doing that. Right. Mm -hmm. I, I, or other things that you do that go, oh, yeah, actually that, that works really well. So it's, it's this big, long process always, always yeah. for, and for me anyway. And I'm yeah. sure it's like that for everybody. It's just, I know some people don't like to admit it, but I will, I'll say it right there. It's well, a long process. On behalf of all of the students, all of your students, <laughs> uh, I must thank you for, for, for putting yourself through uh, a reinvention of sort, a learning things uh, from scratch, if you will, in a different uh, context, because that allows you to uh, maybe be more grounded when you talk to these students. Uh, you know, you understand what it's like to learn something new, uh, you know, reminded of it uh, anyway, right? Uh, whereas, yeah. you know, if you've been only one thing and got to the top of it and stay there and teach people, uh, might be a little bit more uh, uh, less understanding involved there, right? I think it depends. Like it, it's, you know, everybody has so much different backgrounds of experience. Like, I mean, cause you know, I did that, the business analysis stuff with mm -hmm. you too, right? And that yeah. was, I, I, I love that. And it was yeah. really funny though, because people would ask me why I was there. They, they first say, so what do you do? And I'd say, well, I'm a musician and they'd say, but mm -hmm. so why are you here? <laughs> <laughs> and, and, uh, and I, and from one of my classmates, actually, I will say it was kind of this strange backhanded comment that I got from him. I mean, I know it came from a good place, but what he said to me, it was in the, the very first class, it was the overview course. Mm -hmm. And he said to me at the end of it, he's, I, I said to everyone, thank you so much for, this was such a great experience for me. And I really enjoyed working with everyone. And he said, you know, Rosemary, I'm surprised at how much you were able to contribute to this. <laughs> and and uh, and I thought, okay, I I know he meant it from a good place, but it was just kind of funny the delivery of that comment yeah. because I'm sure everyone at that table just sort of went, what? Like, I mean, there was somebody there who had an MBA, and everybody else was sort of like tech backgrounds or IT backgrounds, yeah, and yeah. then there's this arts person <laughs> with this yeah. music degree. Yeah. doing this stuff but i love those courses they were great i i learned a lot from them and i do use them in in a sort of indirect peripheral sort of way with stuff that i do in terms of being organized and projects and stuff it's really useful yeah, yeah. Uh, for our viewers just to expand a little bit so so I, I teach a lot of different courses at several universities on contract and and five programs and uh 78 different uh, courses or whatever it was and, and, and so some of the courses are, are what's called business analysis and, and rosemary it was uh, wonderful to have joined me in many of those courses. And uh, so as I facilitate those courses, uh, as Rosemary said, there's a lot of diversity in the room. Some very technical people come through the technical background, technology, <laughs> IT, some are from you know, the business background, uh, many different backgrounds. But uh, one of the very unique background that, that we have in the room uh, for, for probably for a long time and, and probably ever since is here's somebody who is a professional musician, classical musician, full time and, and dedicated to it and, and looking at a possible kind of uh, different area of learning to kind of augment what she's doing. And so it was a very uh, unique and special experience. And uh, I'm happy you got some uh, good value out of it and <laughs> you enjoyed it. Uh, yeah. I did. It was great. Yeah. Mm -hmm. In fact, is that where we first met? I, I think we might have met uh, just uh, a few we weeks ago. We met at a jam. That. We met at a jam. Uh, we Cat met at a jam, I think Cat a few Reese. months before that, probably. Yeah. And I remember coming to see you at a jam at Richard's Pub. And that's when I talked to you about doing the program. Yeah, yeah. Because I, I remember asking you, saying, is there a place for me in doing <laughs> business analysis? And you said, absolutely. And yeah. I was like, okay. And yeah, then I yeah. did the whole certificate i don't know it was like seven courses I, yeah. I remember some of the classes that i thought i'd just be going oh this is so awful were actually ended up being one of some of my favorite courses um like the enterprise analysis one with the top down yeah i yeah. loved i loved that class um that was great fun and and my my impetus for doing it was sort of to get into coaching mm -hmm. and and to do coaching uh, with companies where 
to, to find creative solutions for things, to get people to look at problems in different ways. Um, that was really why I wanted to do it. But now I'm just back in music full time and I kind of don't have time for that. I know yeah. maybe but when I grow up, things might change. Things might change. You, you never yeah. know. Right. It, it doesn't help. To, it doesn't hurt to have a, a other kind of um, experience and background. So uh, I'm, I was glad you were able to join us for those. And that was a, a yeah. fun run for sure. So so uh, the music that you do these days, um, uh, you are in sort of multiple bands at any given time. And uh, yes. uh, must be a, a busy life with, uh, you have some kids as well. And uh, I do must have be a kids. pretty busy life, yeah? It is busy. Um, well, it's not now. Mm -hmm. um, different kind of busy. I'm managing my kids doing online classes. Um, and, uh, and then still trying to do some of my own stuff. Like, I mean, I, I haven't given up entirely on some of the things that I'm doing. There are things that I've wanted to have more time to work on that I'm actually going to start working on now. I have a pet project that I've been trying. I was actually going to try and launch it this summer, and now it's I, I don't know where where we're going to be with it. But I'm gonna I'll I'm gonna have I'm gonna do some kind of online launch, and we'll see um, how that goes. But I I um I have to admit, like with this, I mean, sort of everything just kind of grinding, not even grinding to a halt. It was like this sort of sudden this is over yeah. uh, and nothing's going to happen was, was pretty daunting for me. And I know for some of some colleagues of mine have expressed the same thing. Like we've just said, like, how do you get out of bed in the morning? Mm -hmm. Like, how do you find purpose? Right. And then eventually I was like, okay, I just want to get outside every day. I mm -hmm. just have to get outside. Now I don't get outside every day, but I try to. The mm -hmm. other thing was um, I've got to practice every day. Like I have to, I have to get, practice every day and I eventually started getting into that too but I mean not far into it I came down with some symptoms mm -hmm. and um, I didn't I didn't have the flu but just as a precaution you know I self-isolated in my basement and I was a basement troll for 10 days and mm -hmm. that was uh I, I didn't like that that was not fun that's not fun um it was really tough but um it's um it yeah, I mean, I some of, there are lots of things that are sort of on hold. Although saxophone quartet, actually, we we did meet last weekend mm -hmm. and and read through a whole bunch of stuff, and I can't tell you how glorious it was to be in the room with three other really great players um, and uh, and play through a lot of a lot of repertoire. Um, and uh, and I gosh, I love those guys. I should mention them because. Um, because they're so good, but uh, Ray Barry and uh, Jean-Francois Picard and uh, Robin Taylor. Mm -hmm. And Jean-Francois actually is kind of the reason why I'm back into playing. I don't know if he knows this, but I will say this. Um, when I was doing my my studying for my GMAT to, to do MBA applications, mm -hmm. he called me one day. It was actually, we were doing our last gig. I wasn't really telling people. I don't a lot of people don't know about my back issues, my shoulder issues. I don't like to complain about that stuff. Mm -hmm. I just sort of like sort of accept it and sort of move on. Mm -hmm. And uh, and so I that was what I was doing. I just sort of said, OK, this gig that we're doing at Christmas is going to be my last gig. And he called me and he, he said, why are you why are you whispering? And I said, oh, I'm in the library. You know, I'm I'm studying to do this GMAT and I'm trying not to disturb people. And he said, why are you doing this? And I said, having all these shoulder problems, I'm sleep at night I'm taking painkillers and he said uh he said you can't quit playing mm -hmm. and I said what and he said no he said you can't quit playing mm -hmm. you like it too much mm -hmm. and so I got home from the library and my husband said so how did it go and I said I don't want to do an MBA <laughs> and he said okay and he and I said I want to go back to playing and that's where I started revisiting my physio but it was a long that was a long three years of physio um yeah. 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 You know, I, I did my MBA back in 2001. I started my MBA after 9 11, like a few days, like, oh. like, like ah, sorry, before 9 11. So, so when I was doing a project with my colleagues, uh, they were like, okay, Dune, we're going to be out for a few days. I said, uh, yeah, understandable, because they were actually uh, uh, leaders in the uh, Canadian forces, right? And they said, yes. we're going to have to go and figure out what our NATO response to this 9 11 is. <laughs> right. <laughs> so that's like, yeah, you know, I so bet. I was thinking like, uh, okay, is this all this business stuff going to still matter, you know, with all the stuff that was happening on 9-11? Right, yeah. That, that was when I started. But uh, 
Hey, we have some of our friends uh, saying some nice things here. We got Aria oh, hey. uh, commenting. Yeah. <laughs> I talk about Aria actually quite a bit. Um, uh, Aria is awesome. Aria is awesome. I Here's haven't a seen him in a while. But yes, doctor, I know. Right? yes, I know. And such a genial human being. I love him. He's always so pleasant and so nice to be around. You bet. So, yeah. yeah. Hey, I yeah. want to show a video clip of your original, one of your original compositions. Oh, gosh. Uh, tell me what, do you have a name for that? Or is it just called original composition number X, Y, Z? <laughs> which, which one is this? Uh, this is the one with you, um, uh, a YouTube video, not the trio, but yeah. the other one, right? Okay. So I'm okay. going to bring it in here so you can kind of see what we're referring to. But uh, okay. uh, the one that's on is your it? website. Yeah, the one that's on your website, I think. So I'm going to just pull it up here. Give me a second. Am I singing? You are singing, definitely. I am singing. Okay, yeah. I know where this is. <laughs> yeah, I'll take Oh, actually, that's live. Yeah, yeah, I'll take myself off here, and I'm going to bring okay. this in. Does that, does, does that uh, ring a bell? It's, uh, it's Frim Fram it? Sauce. All right. It's Frim Fram Sauce, and it's me and Paul Courage, uh, my piano player, my trio, and it's a, us as a duo at La Ronde, actually, uh -huh. yeah, is yeah. what that's from. Yeah, I love singing. Oh my gosh, I haven't done it. I haven't done enough singing in the last couple of months. I should probably get back on top of that too. But yeah, um, <clears throat> yeah that's a fun, fun gig. It's amazing during this, uh, you know, COVID thing. It's amazing how many of us are quite busy. We're probably busier than than normal, just doing different things, right? <laughs> but yeah, uh, I will start it and let me know if you okay. can hear the sound. If you can't, just just give me a signal. But I'll uh, okay. I'll be quiet here. I don't want French fried potatoes, red ripe tomatoes. I'm never satisfied. I want that brim fram sauce with the awesome fade. Wish the father on the side. I don't want pork chops bacon. That won't awaken my appetite inside. I don't want fish cakes and rye bread. You heard what I said. Waiter, I want my fried. I want a brim fram sauce with the awesome fave. We should pop up on the side. Yeah, I love Paul. That was uh, that was awesome. Paul, Paul's such a fantastic piano player. He's and he's just such such a really darling guy to work with like really um mm -hmm. just a really really nice guy and we've had a lot of a lot of good times uh playing at Laurent. and yeah that's one of the things that i was supposed to play at the beginning of this month in fact at at Laurent. i do play saxophone for that too um but it's mostly a vocal jazz gig but we just uh it used to be a trio gig and then it got reduced down um because of budget reasons for the restaurant and so um the nice thing about me playing is that I don't always play on every tune. Sometimes I will do just do instrumentals, but the fact that there's just another thing in the mix there leads uh, takes a little bit of the burden off Paul to be playing all the time in terms of solo stuff, and uh, and so it's kind of like having a three piece, which is nice. But yeah, he's he's so much fun to work with. What a nice nice person. Yeah, and I haven't seen him in ages either. 
Mm. While, while, we're, while, while we're playing some clips, I, I have another one that I'd like to show, and it's the uh, Rosemary C. Uh, trio. And uh, maybe uh, tell us a bit of an intro on that while I queue it up. I'm wondering what this is from. One with Shane. Yeah. Where did you get this? Uh, I have my ways. <laughs> I have oh, my ways. no. <laughs> so. Oh, no. <laughs> now I'm worried. I mm. wonder if it's that video footage that we didn't actually finish. <laughs> you must have gotten this from Shane. Oh, he's in trouble. No, no. Ready? I no, am. There you oh, go. No. hard to watch that in in a really weird sort of way because i i will admit um not i i wished i'd waited a couple of months before i'd done that that demo um only because that summer like about a month later i was in the u.s at a jazz improv workshop and mm -hmm. it was there that actually things really started to take off for me because um i don't know what it was that it that it did for me but there were just uh, there were a lot of really good learning moments. It was an actually, it was an adult workshop run by Jeff Antoniak mm -hmm. and um, who's actually a saxophone player from here, but this was in Maryland. Mm -hmm. And, uh, and then when I came back from that, I did um, rock fest with Paula Perot and she had a, a bunch of people in there that I'd never worked in the band within the band, which one of them was uh, uh, Jeff Bartlett and Greg Pretty. And, and Greg Pretty was playing drums. And afterwards, Craig, Greg Pretty had said, you know, you really did really well there with, uh, with uh, in the band and taking, taking control and stuff. Um, and uh, he said, I think, do you know who Bobby Cameron is? And I said, uh, yeah, I know who that is. And he said, well, I think he needs a saxophone player. I think it should be you. And I said, sure. And, and then weeks went by and I thought, yeah, okay. Like, cause I, you know, lots of people, sometimes it's not that I'm saying people talk and nothing happens, but it does happen. Sometimes people say, Hey, that sounds really great. And then uh, mm -hmm. for whatever reason, the project goes in another direction or whatever, it doesn't happen. Mm -hmm. And uh, sure enough, about six weeks later, I, I got this call from him saying, okay, let's go. And that's how I ended up playing with Bobby Cameron. And, and everything's been like this. I've been super, super busy since that workshop that I did, and I'm really thankful for it, for that experience. And I don't sound really a lot like I do in that video mm -hmm. at all anymore. My sound has changed a lot since then. So it's, it's interesting hearing that and going, 
I mean, it's okay, but there are moments of it that I just go, wow, have I ever just changed a lot as a player for the better? Uh -huh. um, and I've, and I've been really thankful. I loved working with Bobby. I can't, I can't say enough for how much I loved working with Bobby mm -hmm. and, um, and, and lots of people ever since then, like the Latin band has been great. I miss the Latin band. I miss Lynn. Um, I really miss Paul and, uh, Shane, unfortunately, cause he's in Calgary, which is too bad, but he's, he start when he first told me he was singing, he sent me some clips of him and I was like, is that you singing? Cause I didn't realize that he had been singing and he's, he's a really good singer. He yeah. really is. I, and, I, know, and, I know Shane is an ahead. awesome sound man. He, he's done sound. Yes. For, uh, some of my he's bands fantastic. for a little while. Yeah. Yeah. And that's how I know him actually is because he used to do sound for the retrofits. And that's mm -hmm. how I, I ended up knowing Shane and, um, and Shane, um, if you're, if he's listening or not listening, um, I, I, I was so sad when he said he was moving to Calgary and it was just like, Oh no. And, uh, I know he's happy there and that's, that's really fantastic for him. And I know he's spent a lot of time working in Edmonton too, between Calgary and Edmonton after he had moved. Mm -hmm. But, um, but I had no idea he was such a good singer and, yeah. uh, and, and that, that session, actually, I will say this. I remember that room was so hot. It was so hot in there. Like, I'm always usually really cold, and I was sweating buckets. And I felt so badly for Shane and Paul because they were dressed in these, you know, long dress shirts and black pants and stuff. And, and under the lights in this room that was essentially, you know, one step away from being a sauna. And mm -hmm. they... They, they marveled through that in, I think we were there for about four hours and it was just, wow. <laughs> it was so warm in there. <laughs> yeah. yeah. So tell us about this photo, the members of the band here. You guys look great. Oh, um, yeah. So on the far uh, left is Dave Aids, keyboard player, Jeff Bartlett, uh, next to him playing bass. Craig Pretty is uh, playing drums, then Percy Marshall on guitar and Lynn's the singer and then me on, on the other end in saxophone. Um, that was, uh, that was such a riot being in Memphis. Um, we heard so many good, good bands. Uh, I remember being at the, the finals and listening to the finals over there and just having a huge appreciation actually for, uh, Missy, Mississippi, uh, steel guitar. Uh, wow. It was just beautiful. Like I love the solo duo category more than I like the band category. Um, when, when we were listening to the finals, but, um, we had lots of fun, um, had lots of great barbecue pork ribs and chicken and, um, beer, lots <laughs> and lots and lots of beer. And, um, it was great. The band was fun. We had lots of fun when we were there. In other yeah. words, it was more than just music. It was the experience, the full immersion experience, right? The experience was really great. Um, I've been to... Uh, competitions before as a classical player. Um, I've done two international competitions years ago and it's the same thing. Like you just hear, I mean, it's a little bit different there though, because everyone's playing the same, almost always the same repertoire. Like everyone gets a list and there are some choices you can make, but otherwise about 75% of it, everyone's playing the same thing and you get a different flavor for how certain players like to play certain things or certain inter interpretations of classical works, which I really appreciated. What I loved about this competition was, I mean, it wasn't just how great the bands were, but it was actually how, um, how much great writing there was. Like there was a lot of original music and it was, a lot of it was just incredible, mm -hmm. like just incredible. And, and I, and I love that part of it. Um, one of the guys that was in the finals, I can't even remember his name. Um, he was, he was adorable. Like, even even just the the uh, the their their charisma with the audience like I remember him coming out and he was playing his guitar and then he introduced the next tune he was uh, I think he was Spanish originally and was now living in, in on the east coast of the U S but he said uh, he said something about oh yes this next tune it is about uh, it is it is about uh, me saying to to uh, me saying oh baby how can we make this work, which is really another way of her just saying it's over. Mm -hmm. <laughs> <laughs> and, and then he'd start the tune. Like he was just yeah. hilarious. He was so, it was so great. 
Um, and uh, the Orpheum Theater in Memphis is, wow, just a beautiful, beautiful hall. Like it was beautiful. The sound in there was just beautiful. I, 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 I was just blown away by how beautiful that space was and how amazing the sound was in there. Like there wasn't anything that sounded bad in there, nothing. Hmm. And we were sitting up on the second balcony and it was like I, other people were sitting in different places in there and they said it sounded incredible. Like no matter where people sat in there, it's a beautiful, beautiful space. Beautiful. Wow. But yeah, the breadth of of the the original writing was was just incredible. I loved it. I loved hearing that and just hearing the different genres. There's a there was a band from Holland and a band from Switzerland and and their different sort of spins on blues stuff. And it was uh, it was amazing just hearing how some of their stuff was different. And I love I loved that. It was great. Yeah. I, I just there's found, Bobby. I just found on your Facebook there, um, you know, this uh, this photo. Uh, tell us a bit, yeah. a bit more about uh, the Bobby Cameron band. Well, that was, uh, you know, it didn't last, which is sad. Some things were not meant to be. We did one show and then it was done and, and mm -hmm. I was sad. I loved, I will say this though, like I loved the rehearsals. I loved working with Bobby. I loved, um, I, I love his writing. I, I, uh, I, I love his playing. Mm -hmm. I, it was, um, and I really liked working with him and that was, I just can't say enough for how much I love doing that. And I hope I get to do it again. Mm -hmm. He knows that every time I see him, I saw him last year, I saw him last May. And I said, I feel very wistful right now. And he said, why? And I said, well, cause you're playing all these tunes right now and I know all of them and I'm sitting in the back and I want to sing. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so, um, but yeah, he's, he's moved on with other stuff and mm -hmm. that's great. I'm so mm -hmm. glad for him, but, um, yeah, that was, it was, I was, it was really uh, such an honor to work with him. And I learned a lot just by being there, even for, I think it was like two and a half months that we had had that band together. Mm -hmm. Great players in there. Uh, I liked working with all of them. Um, I still run into a few of them. Like Greg, Greg was with Lynn Twill. Um, John Hewitt, I've run into a few times since then as well. Mm -hmm. And uh, and I've really, really enjoyed working with all of them. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So uh, tell us, uh, in all of your musical uh, journey and, and uh, you know, the, the uh, reinvention and, and the evolution of that, <laughs> Yeah. There must be a story that stands out in your mind that you, you just, you know, uh, the audience would um, appreciate if you were to share that story. Do you have a story that's top of mind that, that could be interesting, funny, or uh, insightful? Or uh, what's top of mind when you think of a, a story that you could tell? Oh, <laughs> oh, gosh. I mean, I could, I've certainly told many, like, really crazy things that happened on gigs. Mm-hmm stories um things that audience members have done um no, no, which i no, no. <laughs> things, things that things our that audience would enjoy um yeah um i don't know i mean there's just there's so so much out there i think you know what actually i will i will talk about this this because this was actually an incredibly um, this was an amazing teachable moment for me Mm -hmm. And it was actually from one of my shows that I did for the National Arts Center um, as a teaching musician for the Music Alive program. And it was actually at a, uh, at a, at a Francophone school here in Edmonton. Mm -hmm. um, one of the things that I did for that, that program was I had to travel all through Alberta. So my, my geography of Alberta actually improved immensely. And because I, at the time when I started, I was the only person who did the Francophone shows too, um, I would do this show in French as well. So I would do about 35 shows in a year and uh, about 12 of them were in French and the other 25 were in English. And I ended up going through the entire province. But this this show here was actually at the Vimy Ridge School, mm -hmm. um, which was the K, they had a K to 12 uh, Francophone program there. And um, at the end of this one, I was playing Syrinx, which is a, a, a famous flute work by WC and it's about um, Syrinx. You know, I tell the story of Pan and how Pan was in love with Syrinx and she was not interested in him. And so she would um, 
she changed herself into reeds in, in, in the water in order to elude Pan. But Pan cut the reeds and made Pan pipes from her, which is actually what Pan pipes are, why they're named that is because of this, I think this story, this legend of Syrinx. Anyway, so then the idea is that this is the song that um, Pan played. So I played this piece by Debussy. And at the end of it, one of my, one of the kindergarten kids um, asked me how I knew what it was that I was supposed to play. Like, how did I know what I was supposed to do? Mm -hmm. And so I, it never occurred to me. I mean, this was a kid in kindergarten who probably was, wasn't even able to read. Mm -hmm. So I turned the music around and I said, okay, so, you know, you're, you're reading, you're learning the, the alphabet, right? You're learning the alphabet. You know how the letters work. You know the sounds that those words make. And then you start, or those letters make, and then you put them together, together to form words. And then you get sentences and you get whole books. And I said, so this piece of music is kind of like a book, but it's just, it's got a different kind of alphabet, mm -hmm. right? We've got this musical alphabet and, and how I know, like, and I showed her the staff, the lines of the staff. And, you know, I said, so when it goes down lower, I play a lower note. And when I go up higher, I play a higher note. And I said, so if you can see how the line goes, like it falls, it drops down and it goes up kind of like a musical picture, right? Mm -hmm. In that yeah. way. And it, it, I mean, I sort of thought about that kind of stuff before, mm -hmm. um, but it never really occurred to me. Like this, it, it was one of my favorite questions. I think that it, that I that someone had ever asked me actually at, at anything I've ever done was about how do you know? And it's, I think, I mean, there are lots of musicians that I work with who don't read music at all or don't read chord changes, and they learn things from memory, which is also really amazing in itself. And I've I've taken that to heart and I try to do a lot of that as well. Um, but I, I really, um, it never really occurred to me what a huge um, sort of, uh, not even just an art, but it's a really big skill, music reading. I mean, reading itself, mm -hmm. reading an alphabet, reading in other languages, learning other languages, learning other alphabets. It's, it's a really big skill and it's a really important one in a lot of ways because mm -hmm. Um, although there are oral traditions, there are things where maybe we don't have access to that oral, oral tradition and all we have is a written um, history mm -hmm. of things. I know sometimes, of course, historical um, whatever is also uh, revisionist. Yes. Mm -hmm. But music is not revisionist in that same way. Right. Mm -hmm. Right. I know war history. Yes, that can be revisionist. Absolutely. But music is not. And how how would it be if we didn't have access to scores by Bach mm -hmm. or Mozart or Handel because we didn't know how to read the music or we didn't know how to interpret um, that stuff. And I think that's really important. And that was one of the things with Bobby that we talked about. Bobby's never written down, or I don't think he's written down a lot of his music. And I said, you know, I think it's important that, that you have um, some kind of, just for archival purposes, Mm -hmm. Because maybe 40 years from now, we might not have access to Bobby's recordings, mm -hmm. right? And that's that might be the only archive that we will have of someone's music is yeah. that. Yeah. And I think that's really important. So, yeah, that's probably one of my favorite things that I've ever, ever had happen. And one of my any things is that that yeah. kindergarten kid with that question about how do you know? Mm -hmm. How can you read that? How does yeah. it tell you? Yeah. So, so what I get out of that is uh uh, the, the importance of, um, uh, you know, when, when you teach somebody, oftentimes you, you learn the concept in a new light, in a new way. When you're trying to explain yeah. something, uh, a new way of looking at it might, might sort of uh, arise. Uh, the other thing is, um, you know, you talk about legacy and, and sort of leaving something behind for future generations. Yeah, uh, yes. Who, who may, um, you know, find it uh, valuable in ways that you can't even imagine right so so a legacy and uh, uh yeah it's uh it's an awesome kind of uh music uh you know for a period of my life i was silly enough to think i was too busy for music so i cut it out for 11 years and, and uh, look at you <laughs> for 11 years no music my guitars would be in the basement closed lid and uh just just dusty down there and uh anyway i smartened up when i turned 40 uh, way back when so i think you and i are the same year yeah, yeah. I think so. I'm pretty sure. That, I go. don't want to say. There you go. <laughs>
Um, but I but I have a, I have a milestone birthday coming up this year. That's how I'll put it. Okay. Did you have one this year? Or are you going to have one this year? Been there, done that, bought the t-shirt. Yeah. Oh, last year. <laughs> okay. See, but we're close. Very close. There you go. I knew it. Yeah. Yeah. So thank you um, for joining thank us. Thank you so much for asking me. This is it, lovely. Before we uh, we uh, say goodbye, though, I, I want to uh, ask you another question, if I may. Okay. If you yes. think about all the things that you talked about throughout the hour here, and you want to sort of distill it down to kind of three words that uh, our viewers can sort of hang on to when they, 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 they think of Rosemary Seaver, they're going to think these three words that happen to be relevant in the days that we're living in. What might those three words be that you want to kind of highlight for our viewers? Do you want like a sentence? Does it need to make uh, a sentence? Just, just three separate words, three oh. separate words, completely separate. Uh, uh, learning, learning, Great learning. Um, uh, it's not really a word, but um, uh, you're never too old. Okay, cool. That's a concept. <laughs> Wonderful. Never, never too, too old. old. It's a concept, but yeah, never too old. Um, and uh, have fun. Like mm -hmm. life is too short. If you want to play something, just do it. Share, share. That's share. the word. Share. share. There's a great TEDx video by Jeff Nelson about exact, it's called Fearless Performance, but it's not just about stage fright. And I watch it probably a couple of times a year and it is fantastic. Jeff Nelson, uh, Fearless Performance. And one of his things is share. Mm -hmm. So learning, share, and never too old. No, wonderful. Well, thank you for sharing that. And thank oh, you. Oh, thank for you. <laughs> thank you for your continued learning and continued uh, passing on of your learning to your students, your, your, your music students. And, thank and, you. And thank you for uh, continuing to have fun because, uh, you know, when we have fun, we, uh, we, we transfer the positive energy around the world and, and the world uh, yes. more than ever, more than ever needs yep. positive energy. Absolutely. And, and, you know, even in tough times, I've learned long ago, even in tough times, uh, fun is, uh, is a valid thing, you know, just because yep. times are tough doesn't mean we shouldn't have fun. So, so, uh, yes, yeah. I agree. Yeah. Not so enough we, fun out there. There you go. Uh, so thank you so much for your time today, <laughs> Rosemary. Uh, everybody, this is again, Rosemary Seaver. And uh, uh, again, for everybody, if you could uh, make sure you take good care of yourself and take good care of one another. And until we meet again, enjoy your wonderful afternoon. And if you're in Edmonton area, enjoy the, uh, the rain out there. Uh, I'm sure there's a few songs written about rain, right? Yes. Lots, many. <laughs> All right. Thanks Annie Lennox, again. here comes the rain again. Here comes the rain again. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Thank you so much, Rosemary. Thank you. Thank you.